Warhammer 40k in and of itself is an IP dating all the way back to the mid to late 1980s. Some might even say it's the most popular tabletop war game in the world. Video games based on Warhammer, however, are very much hit or miss. A lot of them are misses, or initial misses that become hits, or hits that become misses? It's hard to tell just based on Steam reviews. As far as hits go, I can definitely name a few. The original Space Marine, Vermintide, a lot of RTS fans recommend Total War Warhammer 2, then there's Vermintide 2, the ever entertaining Darktide, a lot of people like Rogue Trader from what I hear, and just as many liked Bolt Gun, and finally the subject of today's breakdown, Warhammer 40k Space Marine 2, the biggest hit thus far. It only took 13 long years to get a sequel to the original Space Marine, and it's an interesting tale. The first game was developed by Relic Entertainment, and they were going to be the studio to tackle the sequel, but the project was cancelled. Why was it cancelled? I'm glad you asked. Relic Entertainment was acquired by THQ in 2004. In 2013, THQ was between a rock and a hard place, financially speaking, in the midst of filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy while also liquidating their assets in an attempt to pay back a $50 million bank loan. In the process of that liquidation, THQ sold Relic Entertainment to Sega and abandoned the rights to the Warhammer 40k franchise, bringing an end to the Space Marine sequel before development even officially started. Plus, of course, THQ still shut down. In 2021, when most had given up hope, Warhammer 40k Space Marine 2 was announced on December 9th with a cinematic trailer at the 2021 Game Awards. The long-awaited sequel was developed by Saber Interactive, a studio whose list of titles is quite the mixed bag of ups and downs. Will Rock, some of the Halo games as part of the Master Chief Collection, Mudrunner, World War Z, which I enjoyed, uh, and Vampire, just to name a few. Funny enough, I noticed two large parts of Space Marine 2's mechanics that were inspired by World War Z, which we'll get into shortly. As evident by the Game Awards trailer from all those years ago, as well as the box art for the game, and any number of clips or memes of the game you've seen if you've been on social media since the game's release on September 9th, the man himself, Dimitri and Titus, is back in action. If you'd like to know what all he got into in the first game, I pieced together a story recap of the game's events, which you should totally watch. Where the first game dealt with orcs, the majority of whom have a sense of humor about them, this game throws you up against endless swarms of Tyranids, hive-minded insectosaurs whose collective goal is to harvest and consume any living organisms of a planet, people, animals, trees, oceans, everything, and then move on to the next planet. Obviously, we can't leave a threat like that unchecked. The prologue of Space Marine 2, and the campaign to a greater extent, do their jobs beautifully. It presents the massive threat that you'll be dealing with and teaches you everything you'll need to know in order to fight the enemy. One of the big inspirations present from the World War Z game is the size and scale of the hordes of enemies that you'll be fighting off. Sometimes you'll be tasked with holding your position or defending somewhere, and you'll see dozens if not hundreds of Tyranids either stampeding in the background of the area or piling up the walls in order to reach your position. However, instead of being a fragile human against countless undead, here you're an 8 foot tall, heavily genetically modified super soldier who can pull off superhuman feats of deadliness all while weighing as much as a small car and moving as fast as one. There's an excerpt from, I think it's one of the 40k Horus Heresy books called Age of Darkness where it's described in detail what it's like for a normal person to witness a space marine in action and after reading that you can't help but feel unstoppable when you play as one. The campaign is the first mode you'll be thrust into. It can be completed on your own, or with up to two other players who will assume the role of Titus's two squadmates. You have scant few things you can customize in this mode, unless you bought the Deluxe Edition, which would give Titus and your multiplayer characters two weapon skins and a right pauldron. You're given a small selection of weapons to assemble a loadout from before you set out on a mission, and while you are in mission, you can find support pods housing a variety of other weapons you can test. The campaign will get you more familiar with combat mechanics like parrying and gun strikes, and it will also teach you how to effectively handle every enemy type currently in the game. Now, enemies come in three sizes. Minoris, tiny and weak, Majoris, bigger and tougher, and Extremis, specially able threats that could pose an issue if not dealt with immediately. Enemy waves will always have Majoris and Minoris enemies at minimum but slaying Minoris enemies should never be the immediate focus unless they are well and truly getting on your nerves. 
Majoris and Extremis enemies are the real threats. Majoris Tyranids are the last stop for the Tyranid hive mind before it gets to Minoris enemies. If you kill the nearby Majoris Tyranids, the Minoris will scatter, despawning most of them at once and stunning any stragglers that remain. Majoris and Extremis enemies are easily dealt with on their own, but they're real nasty when combined with dozens of Minoris enemies, so you have to be able to focus on the big guys even with the little ones nipping at you. Big melee attacks will briefly stun nearby Minoris, and one or two of them will become open to a gun strike, a shot that deals big damage, expends zero ammunition, and recovers one peg of your armor. Essentially your overshield that protects your health. Alternatively, you can use your melee weapon to parry light attacks from any enemy type, and, if they're above Minoris type, multiple successful parries, or a well-timed dodge, will open the enemy up to a gun strike. Once the enemy takes critical damage, they'll flash red, enabling you to perform an execution, which will also restore some of your armor. Chaining gun strikes and executions will keep your armor full and your health safe. If you do take health damage, let's say 25% worth of health damage, you'll have 25% of your health bar be white, which is temporary health that can be regained as actual health by dealing melee damage to enemies or performing executions. You just have to be quick because temporary health drains fairly quickly. While in a story mission, you can find ammo boxes to stay stocked up, different types of grenades to help clear out tougher enemies or break up massive hordes, and Medicaid stims, which are your only method of healing lost health. There are also collectible data slates that you can find if you want to hear how awful your current location was from the POV of a now deceased normal person. Lastly, the campaign is a decent length, capping at somewhere in the neighborhood of 6 to 8 hours, depending how fast you move, or which of the four difficulties you're playing on. Whether or not you're new to 40k, I believe the campaign is worth experiencing at least once. Operations, the co-op PvE mode, is where you may spend the majority of your time after beating the campaign, or before since you can play Operations prior to finishing the campaign. Here, you can play an assortment of missions that run parallel to what Titus's squad is doing in the campaign, which is honestly pretty cool as it rounds out the game's story in an equally fun and fresh way. To start, you'll have to pick a class, of which there are currently six. Tactical is close to how you play in the campaign, a standard space marine, equipped with a primary, a sidearm, and, old reliable, a chainsword. Tactical's ability is the Auspex Scan, which marks all enemies within its AoE, increasing the damage you and your teammates do to those targets in scan range. Next, we have my main class, Assault, who can only use a secondary and melee weapon. Assault's ability is the use of his jump pack, which launches you high enough to soar over nearby enemies and allows you to charge and execute a slam attack, perfect for flying to the aid of allies. The jump pack in Operations is severely nerfed compared to everything it can do in the campaign, yet not as nerfed in Eternal War, but I'm not mad about it. I promise. The Vanguard class is quick, slick, and lethal, able to use a primary and secondary, and only the combat knife, which might sound lame, but it's perfect for how agile he is. Vanguard's ability, the Grapnel Launcher, lets you zoom toward any enemy within range and give him a mighty big kick, which also stuns nearby Minoris enemies. You can Grapnel up or down to enemies as well, which is very helpful in escaping the bulk of large hordes. You'll need to as well, because along with Sniper, Vanguard has a lower armor value than the other classes. Up next we have Bulwark, who's equipped with a great shield that he can use to check a wide arc of enemies in front of him just to make them back up for a moment. If things are looking a bit hectic, Bulwarks can use their ability, Chapter Banner, to plant the Ultramarines Chapter Banner, providing an AoE that restores armor to all allies within it. Bulwark can use a sidearm for situations that are a bit out of melee range, but melee will be your bread and butter, so remember to use your shield to absorb ranged damage as you move from target to target. The sniper's role is to hang back and take care of Majoris enemies from great distances using any one of their selectable long-range primaries. Should the situation get personal, they can use their sidearm and combat knife to fight back, or use their ability, Camo Cloak, to disappear from sight. That's really handy for repositioning yourself to a better vantage point, or reviving teammates if a massive horde gets the better of you. Last, but certainly not least, the Heavy. The Heavy uses heavy guns and has access to a sidearm, but no melee weapon to speak of. Just a swing of their heavy gun or a big stomp to push enemies back and start firing again. Their ability is the Iron Halo, which spawns a frontal shield that nullifies all ranged damage, to a point, which is extra helpful to other more range capable classes like Sniper or Tactical, as they can pick off targets from the cover of the shield. 
all those classes are the same ones that are available in the Eternal War PvP mode, so getting familiar with one before jumping into that mode will be well worth your time. Each class has a specific selection of weapons you can pick from to assemble a loadout, and each weapon can be progressed to stronger versions via armory data and coins. Armory data to unlock the next tier of versions, and coins to buy the versions themselves. Once the maximum amount of XP has been reached with a weapon version, you gain a mastery point, which is used to unlock new perks in that weapon's perk tree. In order to reach the end of whatever path you choose in the weapon's perk tree, you will have to purchase and complete all of that specific weapon's available versions. Fortunately, you can skip earning XP for a weapon version by simply spending another armory data on it. Be sure to check the stats of a weapon version before unlocking it, as they are not just wholly beneficial across the board. Some may drop your gun accuracy in favor of reload speed. Some may increase the swing speed of your melee weapon, but cut its strength in half. If you want to just get a version that's all benefits and no drawback, it may be as lackluster as adding plus one to your firepower or strength. It's up to how you play in order to decide if the drawbacks are worth the benefits. Buying weapon versions also gives you the appearance of that new version that you can equip regardless of what version you actually have selected and as someone who admires drip over stats, that's fantastic. One thing to keep in mind, certain weapons are selectable by a few different classes, so upgrading something like the chain sword or the bolt pistol to an artificer version or even a relic version would mean a different class with access to either weapon would start with a very strong weapon right out the gate. Pro tip, unlocking a new weapon version does not automatically equip the latest version to every class that's allowed to use the weapon. You have to go to every loadout on every class that uses that weapon and swap out the old version to the new. Now you don't have to learn that the hard way. You also have class perks, which are benefits to your class mechanics, class specific equipment, or even your class ability. And this is where another inspiration from the World War Z game shows itself. The class perks are laid out in a grid-like arrangement with eight columns and three rows. Each time you level your class after level one, you unlock a perk up to the max, which is level 25. You may think that's a lot of benefits, and it would be nice to unlock them all, but there's a caveat. You can unlock every perk, but you can only select one perk from each column. You can switch your selection if you think a different assortment of perks would work better in a specific mission, against a certain enemy, or with certain other classes you will play with. But out of those 24 perks, you can only receive the benefits from eight at a time. You can unlock them all to have the freedom of choice, or review your class's whole perk grid and plan out which perks would benefit you the most, only unlocking those. The choice is yours. Once you select your class, loadout, and perks, it's mission time. Once in a mission, there's no time limit, but enemy waves will periodically spawn in order to keep you moving. On any difficulty above minimal, you may get a terminus enemy, which is essentially a mid-boss, complete with a big health bar and its own music. It's common practice to eliminate all other enemy types around you or keep the terminus enemy away from the rest of the enemies in the area in order to keep the fight contained and less dangerous for your team. Your alert system, posted at the center of the top of the HUD, lets you know what enemy types are nearby or what kind of enemy wave is currently on its way to you, giving you time to pick a spot to hold out in or plan a route to try and escape to the next section of the mission. Majora's enemies have the added ability in operations to call for backup, but this can be interrupted with a decent amount of damage or a large attack, like a ground slam from the assault class or a well-placed shot from your team sniper. Throughout operations missions, there will be ammo caches, grenades, and data slates, much like in campaign, but no guns to find lying around. If you need to change weapons, you can only do so at an armory pod, which is found somewhere along the main path of the mission, and you can only select from one of the three class loadouts that you should have edited and saved before the mission. Also available in operations missions are Armor Boosts, Armory Fragments, Guardian Relics, and Gene Seed. Armor Boosts will refill your armor value and then add on temporary armor, maxing it out at 4 pegs, which is great for classes with low armor like Vanguard or Sniper, and that bonus armor lasts until it's depleted by the usual means. Armory Fragments can be gained from interacting with a hidden servo skull somewhere in the mission, or from a defeated Terminus enemy, and they can be used to unlock new tiers of weapon versions. Guardian Relics enable you to get yourself back up when you are down due to lack of health. Speaking of lack of health, if you go down and a teammate revives you, you'll be left with a mortal wound, which means the next time you go down, you will actually die and respawn after a short while. 
To prevent a mortal wound, you would have to use a guardian relic to get yourself up, or once you have the wound, you would have to heal your HP to its maximum. Gene Seed provides a 30% boost to the total XP you gain from the mission, but it's tricky because you have to make it through the mission with it, successfully, without going down, otherwise the Gene Seed will disappear and your teammates will be quietly disappointed in you. If you come across resources that you can't make use of, be a team player and tag it to make it visible to your team. Tagging is the best form of communication with your teammates aside from text or voice chat because there's no easier way to call out an ammo pickup or a sniping enemy off in the distance. Speaking of communication, since all the classes are actual characters as far as the story goes, they'll talk to each other from time to time, and the interactions are pretty great. Scipius, I am glad to have your eye covered. My brother shield. I shield my brother. Just at the Codex Direx. Of course. But I also happen to prefer my squad mates in one piece. That's pretty much all there is to explain about operations missions. Once you successfully slay the heretic and purge the foul Xenos, your reward will include a strictly cosmetic piece of armor for your class, access to a new class perk if you leveled up, armory data, and coins which can be used to unlock all manner of things. Once you and your boys safely return to the main hub, you hit the armoring hall to equip your cold new drip, Edit your perks, rearrange your loadouts if necessary, and head back out to do it all again. One last thing before I forget. If you're alone in your lobby in operations mode, check out trials. Each class has three available trials which familiarize you with the roles and abilities of the class you're doing the trial with. The trials themselves provide the gear, and they're not level gated. I'm bringing them up because each trial, when completed with an A rank, rewards one mastercrafted armory data, which is okay, and 25 coins, which is good for 40 to 90 seconds work. Three trials per class, across six classes, means that's six average difficulty missions worth of mastercrafted armory data, and a whopping 450 coins, all said and done in less than half the time it'd take you to complete one operations mission. Just thought I'd let you know. Operations mode is currently only six missions, three for one enemy faction and three for the other, which may become stale if you play them enough, in all fairness. But, if you're a 40k fan and you've longed to bring death to the foul Xenos in the name of the Imperium of Mankind as a fully capable Adeptus Astartes, Operations mode will be your new addiction. Lastly, we have the Eternal War PvP mode. I had no plans to dip my toes into PvP in this game, but it honestly wasn't too bad. The first thing I noticed is that the leveling system in Eternal War is separate from that of Operations, and it's referred to as your Veterancy level, which increases as you play the mode. Instead of leveling each class individually as an Operations mode, Veterancy is one consolidated leveling system. Weapons are still divvied up based on class, and you can actually select grenades as part of your class loadouts here. But the weapons unlock for use based on your Veterancy level, the same way they would unlock in a typical PvP shooter. Two things I don't appreciate about Eternal War are, one, any cosmetic or heraldry edits you made to your classes and operations do not carry over to Eternal War, meaning you'll have to recustomize them all again, and two, weapon skins also don't carry over, instead being unlocked when you win however many matches it takes to unlock the skin you want, and then you have to spend coins to unlock that skin. The good news is there are no class or weapon perks or weapon versions, which keeps the playing field even. Another good thing is that you're able to have up to two of the same class on your team, which is a good limit. That way you don't run into an entire team of vanguards or assaults, because that would suck in so many ways. There are currently three game modes. Seize Ground, where you have to capture and hold three zones. Capture and Control, where your team has to capture and hold a single zone that relocates every 90 seconds. And Annihilation, which is basically Team Deathmatch. If you think people will focus the objective in the other modes besides Annihilation, you'd be wrong. Completing matches earns you XP towards your Veterancy level, XP towards the rank of the class you were using, coins to spend, and sometimes new armor pieces to equip in the Armoring Hall. I'm not sure what class ranks do besides denote how much you've played a specific class to other players. The great thing is, whether you're winning in PvE missions or PvP matches, you will earn new armor pieces to equip to your class characters. The only decision when you sit down to play is what you have time for, some 25 to 40 minute missions and operations, or 10 to 15 minute matches in Eternal War. 
I haven't seen many bugs or glitches since I've been playing Space Marine 2. There have been some reports, that I can confirm, of disconnecting from sessions, but luckily for me, I've only disconnected from missions after the mission has been completed. As far as matchmaking, it's spotty. You could get two really good teammates and breeze through a mission, or you could get stuck babysitting a level 1 trying to slip into a mission at a difficulty he is wholly unprepared for, making himself a complete liability and not the asset that's required. You could also get no additional teammates because sometimes matchmaking just doesn't bring you anybody. It depends on the day. Point being, bring two friends, or if you don't have two friends, hit up the Space Marine 2 LFG Discord server where I've found nothing but great players for any activity in the game. Then there's the Gene Seed issue I ran into. I've died while holding the Gene Seed, but the item itself dropped on the ground after I went down, available for my friend to run by and grab it before reviving me. Any other time, it disappears after a down without a trace. I don't know which is actually programmed to happen, but until the devs patch it one way or another, just don't die while carrying it. The final thing I will say is that, simply put, your mileage may vary. There are currently 6 or 7 campaign missions, which, as I said earlier, shouldn't take you more than 6 to 8 hours to do, and after that you can bathe in the blood of a tsunami of enemies in any of the 6 currently available operations missions, or clown on other players in Eternal War. As it stands now, Space Marine 2 is a monumental follow-up to a criminally overlooked game from the golden age of gaming, which is how I refer to the PS3 360 era. Sabre has released a roadmap for the rest of this year into 2025, and after the 60-something hours I've spent fighting alongside my battle brothers thus far, I know I'll be present for every content update from here on out. But that's just my two cents. Warhammer 40k Space Marine 2 is available now on PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X and S, GeForce Now, of all places, and PC for $60. One last thing, I've seen a lot of posts about people new to 40k playing Space Marine 2 asking questions about the best methods to learn more about the world of 40k. If that's you, you should know. There are dozens of books, as many audiobooks, YouTube channels like Luton09 and Vox in the Void, there are good video games I mentioned at the start, the tabletop game that you may have to liquidate some assets in order to afford, and a small number of official and fan-created animations, including that one episode of the upcoming series, Secret Level. Warhammer 40k is nothing short of accessible to all types of consumers, so don't be afraid to dive in. Anyway, leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and subscribe if you want to see more. This has been your battle brother, Cygnus Jason, and I will race you to the slaughter.